Coming up on DTNS, want a hit song? Think memes, plus the Indian app that will soon sweep the world, and why you do want a 4K Super Mario 64. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo 2020. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And in Helsinki, not really, but in Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. And I'm the uh, show's producer, Roger Chang. Would you say you're Helsinki influenced, Helsinki adjacent? Yes, I am Helsinki adjacent. If a couple of hours by car qualifies as Helsinki ish. <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> uh, we were just talking about the postal service, the band, and the place that delivers your letters, uh, along with all kinds of other good stuff, including a secret podcast idea on Good Day Internet. Get all of that and more. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple announced its first virtual WWDC will start on June 22nd and be free through its developer app and also developer website. In the past, WWDC has been a paid event for most attendees after submitting tickets through a lottery system. A new event included this year is called Swift Student Challenge for younger developers 13 years of age and up. Also, 9 to 5 Mac reports that 21 of Australia's 22 Apple stores will reopen May 7th at 10 a.m. local time. The only one not reopening will be the flagship Sydney Apple Store, which is closed in January for re renovations. Twitter is testing showing a message to people whose posts have words similar to tweets that have been reported. The message will give the user a chance to reconsider the post. The test will run for two weeks on English language tweets. Amazon confirmed that a worker from one of its Staten Island warehouses has died of COVID-19. Amazon says the employee last was on site April 5th and confirmed to have COVID-19 April 11th. Amazon is not releasing numbers of cases of infection among workers. The first known COVID-19 related death of an Amazon warehouse worker took place March 31st in Hawthorne, California. A second Amazon warehouse employee died April 1st in Tracy, California. Microsoft revealed its new Xbox Series X boot screen animation in a teaser video for gameplay event coming on Thursday, May 7th. A couple days from now, Microsoft has promised to reveal more uh, about the upcoming titles in July on its platform. In response to rumors of delays, though, Microsoft says, quote, our goal remains to launch Xbox Series X and Halo Infinite this holiday. Thursday's event will also include games that are optimized for the Xbox Series X, including titles that support 4K, 120 frames per second, direct storage, hardware accelerated direct X ray tracing, and faster load times. Mozilla launched Firefox 76 on Tuesday for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Users can download Firefox 76 for desktop from firefox.com, and existing users should be upgraded automatically. Firefox 76 has a new Firefox Lockwise password manager functionality, Zoom improvements, and a new developer feature, and new developer features, several of them. Hey, Wonderlist fans, you might have been thinking tomorrow was a depressing day, but I've got some good news for you. Wonderlist founder Christian Raber announced a new company called Superlist. You know what's better than Wonder? Super. Uh, it has the aim to make a productivity tool. I'm going to guess it has to do with tracking to-do items, but I don't know. I'm just guessing. Uh, Weber called the app an investment into the next generation of Wonderlist. Uh, if you recall, Microsoft acquired Wonderlist in 2017 and will shut it down May 6th. California's it's Attorney General... Nice. No. California's Attorney General sued Uber and Lyft Tuesday for classifying its drivers as independent contractors. Several California cities joined the state in its lawsuit. All right, let's talk a little bit about Amazon's first big uh, not-on-a-tablet game, Patrick. <laughs> Indeed, this is uh, momentous for Amazon and gaming, potentially. Amazon's free-to-play PC multiplayer game Crucible will launch May 20. Players can choose from characters with specific abilities in three game modes. Heart of the Hives is a four versus four mode with two players playing against AI-controlled enemies. Alpha Hunters put, puts eight teams of two against each other in a battle royale. 
Harvester Command puts two teams of eight in a contest to collect essences and level up characters. Amazon also plans to release an MMO called New World in August. So Crucible sounds like they said, what are the three most popular ways people are playing games right now? Let's put them all in a game called Crucible. Yeah, it's uh, difficult to know exactly what Amazon is doing with gaming because they have been talking about it for a long time. Obviously, they bought Twitch, um, which is the main streaming platform for gaming and has been for a long time as well. Uh, but they haven't released anything until Crucible. I believe if they did, uh, it skipped right by me. Um, and this seems they had projects before um, that one was actually in beta for a long time as well, but it felt like a checklist product. And obviously Amazon has a lot of firepower, but so far they haven't released anything that caught fire and they haven't released anything um, that, well, they, they have canceled a bunch of things. It, they want to go big on gaming, and we've heard that rumors about the streaming service that's being worked on. I believe it's called Tempo or something like that. Um, but there, it seems they're meandering a little bit. So it's a mystery. I, it's funny that you should say that because I haven't felt that they're meandering at all. I had heard a couple of years ago they were going to launch a PC game and it was going to have Twitch interactivity. This doesn't say anything about Twitch interactivity. But other than that, this just feels like, oh, they finally got to that point. And I know this has been delayed a couple times, but meandering to me would be putting something out and then it fails and then they pull it back. I I, I just, I am maybe not close enough to this to, to notice that, but it, it feels like this is now the start of something. Well, they did have a game that was released and that they uh, interrupted. I can't for remember PC? for the life of me now. Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I can't remember the name. I, I'm a bad journalist. I, I'm sorry. But uh, there was one, and I played it. It was okay. But it <laughs> felt like something that was created uh, with, again, a kind of a checklist in mind. Mm. And uh, this, as you mentioned, kind of feels a little bit the same way. We, we'll play it soon. It might be incredible. Um, but to me, what it highlights a little bit is something I've been talking about for a while, which is the gaming industry and the tech industry seem like uh, they are very close and it should be easy to transfer from one to the other. And a lot of tech people think it will be an easy thing to do. And what we've seen over and over again is that it's not such an easy thing. The gaming industry is very specific, requires a lot more um, expertise and know-how and uh, uh, understanding than people think. And uh, so even big, big players have found middling success. And I think I would put at this point... Uh, Amazon kind of in that category, potentially. Well, speaking of middle in success, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say that Facebook's Oculus division is building multiple potential smaller and lighter versions of the Quest VR headset, but that the device may be facing development and supply chain delays due to the impact of COVID-19. The headsets reportedly have redesigned controllers and are more comfortable to wear. They're lighter. Facebook also has said to have want to have wanted to launch the new model around its annual Oculus Connect conference, which happens later this year. However, delays could push that to 2021. You know, yeah. I was just thinking about this the other day because I've got a quest. I'm 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 in at deep uh, notes mode for my next live with it segment. And I mean, there are so many nice things I can say about it, but the one thing is it's bulky. And after a period of more than 30 minutes, I want it off my head. So something that's lighter and, you know, it is more comfortable, like that's good going to be the number one issue for anybody, you know, whether you like it or, you know, are a huge, like, you know, fanboy or not. Um, but, but yeah, this is a great example of supply chain pushing things back. It's definitely uh, something that will need to happen to try and push VR even more than it is now because the Quest is, it, for my money, the best compromise and the best option, especially since you can now use it as a wired uh, headset as well. But yeah, it is bulky. Um, I 
will myself into having it on my face for a couple of hours. But when you take it off, you re remember what your head is like without <laughs> it on it. And it is a joy. I guess you get that uh, as a reward for having it, kept right. it on your head. Right. But um, if, if it was, you know, if there is a, a lighter, uh, smaller model, it, it could become really an incredible uh, version of VR. Well, and that was, you know, my first reaction, we, you know, when I first put, you know, it on for, you know, and this was my only VR headset, uh, you know, at least that I owned personally. And, you know, I was, I was being able to, to judge, you know, it was like, wow, this is way cooler than I thought it would be. But after <laughs> some time, you know, you take it all off, you know, you got like marks on your face and it's like, okay, we, this is, this is the first version, you know, it's like, it's like Apple watch V1, you know, people are like, this is really great. It's going to be like a whole new product category, but there's some issues. Yeah, like I, I see where quest is in that situation. The big advantage with the quest was you're not tethered <laughs> and, and it still looks good. Uh, and I think the other thing that's fascinating about this is that means they can possibly get you to upgrade to a new Quest VR that doesn't have that much different internally, uh, which makes it easier for game developers who don't have to adapt to a new platform if it's mostly the same inside and has the same screens, et cetera. But you'll still want to buy a new one because it's more comfortable. Like that's that's an aspect that you don't see with consoles where where if you want to get people to buy the new console, you've got to give them a new platform, which means developers now have to adapt to that new platform. I mean, I wouldn't mind more, you know, computing power. Sure. No, I don't think anybody would, but it, I guess what I'm saying is you might not, you might still upgrade just for the comfort because of the fact that it, it's like, well, I can get 30 minutes to an hour, a couple hours maybe, but what if I could wear it all day long? I don't know. Maybe you don't <laughs> want to do that. Yeah, maybe not. You would Are if you, it felt better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would. Okay, good to know. Uh, we'll be doing the show in VR soon. I can tell you that right. <laughs> the UK's National Health Service is testing its centralized contact tracing app among 142,000 people on the Isle of Wight uh, starting Thursday. It will record when people are within two minutes, uh, two meters of each other for more than 15 minutes. So this is similar than to a lot of the efforts out there. However, the UK is doing a centralized system, not a decentralized system like Apple and Google propose. So with the UK system, the first part of a user's postcode will be stored in the app, in the app uh, and each device will have a fixed code, not a rotating one. Now, this will be an anonymous code, but it means that if you were able to figure out who was behind the code, then you'll have all the information. Whereas a rotating system like Apple and Google work on would be harder to crack because you'd have to find all the different codes. Uh, France is also using a centralized system, not the Apple Google system. And that means neither France nor the UK can take advantage of the API, which helps let apps access Bluetooth in the background. So if you're using the Apple Google platform on iOS, you can access Bluetooth in the background, meaning the app uh, won't hog the battery. The UK and French apps will need to wake to record contacts, which means they will drain the battery a little more. There's more chance for interference and something to go wrong. Some people think that it's possible that an Android phone would have to be nearby for two iOS phones to even wake up each other. Uh, France's Minister for Digital Technology, Cedric O, oh, told BFM Business TV, quote, Apple could have helped us make the application work even better on the iPhone. They have not wished to do so. France's app is expected to be ready for testing May 11th. It, it, it actually won't be ready uh, on May 11. It was initially expected to be ready, but it won't be. And that story, both the UK and France's choice are baffling because they know uh, how it will work without access to uh, constant background access to uh, Bluetooth, which we suspect will be not very well it won't work very well and so they're in a position where they're arguing that the app is useful um which some people are arguing that it wouldn't be but they're saying it would be useful even with low usage but they're choosing a method that will limit its capability it seems to me like some kind of long-term political play rather than an actual technical choice um, but I, it, either way, if you can't tell, I don't understand that decision. Um, 
and it, it's very hard to make sense of. However, uh, you know, whatever Cedric O is saying, um, it's very difficult to understand why you would go that way, especially if the app supposedly could help um, ending sheltering and things like that. Um, yeah, it's it's a little confusing. I, I see the story now that you're mentioning uh, on Barron's that they, they said it will not be ready for May 11th. It'll be ready for June 2nd. But that's also what Reuters says, which is ready to be deployed June 2nd, but begin testing May 11th. Either way, uh, the point is the same, which is that you're not going to get even the centralized app until later. Yeah, and, and the, the problem is even when you do end up getting it, it's not going to, I mean, us technical people will understand that on iOS, if Bluetooth is uh, locked down and you can't access it in the background, then your app is not going to be very efficient at tracking Bluetooth. And that is, uh, maybe they found some kind of partial workaround, but uh, it, it technologically and health-wise, it seems like a strange decision. Yeah, I, it feels like, what the what I'm feeling from the UK and France is very similar to what tech companies were doing for years, which is, hey, but you can trust us. We won't do anything bad. So let us have a little more data. We can do a lot more good with it. Trust us. And of course, the tech companies have lost that trust and are saying, in this case, uh, we know that people don't trust us, so we're going to really limit this stuff. Uh, and and it's a it's an interesting flip of the roles between government and tech in this mm. particular situation. Yeah, and in this specific case, the issue wouldn't necessarily be with this app because they have vowed to keep it open source and to have a bug bounty program. So I'm pretty sure this app wouldn't be an issue for security and for personal data. The issue is that it opens the door to if you've made an exception for tracking uh, background Bluetooth for this app, then the government asks for this in another situation that's a little bit different, or another government asks for a different situation, and it's more difficult to say no at that point. So yes, well, we are. And, and as we know, uh, Facebook didn't allow people to use third-party data, uh, and yet someone went and gave someone third-party data. So if in the Apple Google situation, if there is just no way to track a number back to a person, it's really difficult for that to be subverted. Whereas if there's a centralized server with a number that is identified with you, there's more possibility for something to go wrong. Yeah, that uh, we could talk about this for a little while, but uh, yeah, it is baffling for a number of reasons. All right, Indian company Glance has reached 100 million daily active users in 21 months. Glance provides video news, games, and other content on Android lock screens. Machine learning is used to personalize what gets shown. Glance says about 25% of its users play games on the platform, and users spend an average of 25 minutes a day on Glance content. Glance has deals with multiple Android phone makers in India, including Xiaomi and Samsung. Glance is available in India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines with plans to go global in the next few years. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we mentioned this because 100 million daily active users in 21 months is incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the kind of company where like they're just adding users. They don't really know what their monetization plan is other than licensing uh, to phone makers. So it reminds me, it fits the profile of the kind of thing you'll be hearing about in the future of like, oh my gosh, this glance thing, which was really popular in India is now sweeping the world uh, to, to just file that one away in, in the back of your mind to, to keep an eye out. It might end well, up being nothing or not. Who knows? And also, you know, for those of us who are like, oh, content on lock screens. That's interesting. Clearly, it works for a lot of folks. Like, mm -hmm. this is, you know, how back in the day it was like, oh, should we all download that app that no one's ever heard of from that company we've never heard of? This is how it all starts. Mm -hmm. A YouTube channel called Unreal posted a 12 minute gameplay video of a fully functional native 4K version of Super Mario 64 for PC powered by DirectX 12. It's not been emulated, has built-in controller support. The uh, entire game appeared online over the weekend. Hard to find, though. Depends on where you look. Fans worried about Nintendo cracking down on the port, not sharing links. Decompiled Super Mario uh, 64 code uh, leaked last year, which might have led to the port. And ports are rumored to be coming to the Switch later this year as well. Patrick? Um, this... 
Yeah, this is one of the seminal uh, Mario games. It's essentially the first 3D Mario game, which was very innovative at the time. And um, it's kind of playful uh, to do these things. It's not uncommon, of course. Uh, you can imagine that these kind of things would happen. The fact that it runs natively on PC is impressive, uh, but it's been available through emulation for a long time. So it wouldn't, you know, it's not like it's, changing uh, the relationship to Mario 64. Uh, Nintendo has been notoriously, is notoriously litigious about these kinds of things, so I understand why people don't want to share links. But it's a, it's a fun, interesting thing. It's not like, oh, we can finally play Mario 64 on PC. We could already do it. It was just through emulation. So I, yeah, maybe I mean, we'll have a, a ray tracing version thanks to this thing, and that could be interesting. I've seen a lot of people just glowing about how good it looks, though, compared to the emulated versions. And 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 in fact, I can't remember. It might have been Polygon. It might have been somewhere else that said this is the way you remember Super Mario sixty four looking, <laughs> even though it never did. Like in your childlike imagination, uh, this is this is what you thought it looked like back then, uh, which is interesting. And like you said, just that subculture of Reddit not sharing something to protect the sources is fascinating to watch. You you think of the internet as the place that just can't hold back, right? Uh, and can't control itself. And this is an, uh, an interesting switch on that. Indeed. Hey, if folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Music blog Consequence of Sounds, Maggie Gates wrote an article titled Embracing a Future Where Memes Choose Hit Songs. The fate of a pop artist now belongs in the hands of Twitch, Twitter, and TikTok. Uh, she notes that hit songs now are not arising from you know, being pushed by onto DJs like they were in the fifties or, or having a, an association with, with hot brands and, 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 uh, movies. Uh, but they're arising on the internet. Lyrics are being tailored to Instagram captions. You want to promote that song? Make sure you got a lyric. Somebody can snip out and put in the caption of their Instagram videos need to have tweetable screenshots that you can throw a meme on. Choruses should be good for TikTok dance moves. Uh, we are seeing music catering to this because the songs take off if they have these aspects. Uh, examples include Lil Nas X, Old Town Road, uh, Drake, all of Drake, every Drake ever. <laughs> uh, Lizzo, Zach Fox is used as an example of someone who rose to fame with the ridiculously catchy song, Jesus is the One, parentheses, I Got Depression. Uh, they even note that Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe was an early example of this sort yeah. of taken off on the web with all A the lip A little bit of an OG, OG yeah. example of this. Yeah, you know, it's it's this is this is interesting because I know that in many cases, the artists that are being um, called out as, well, they're meme artists now. The artists themselves don't necessarily have to subscribe to this whole methodology. But, you know, in Lizzo's case, like, how many times have you seen someone be like, just took a DNA tint? <laughs> you know, like, you've seen it so many times. Like, Turns because it's out just. I'm 100% super Mario. Whatever. Right, whatever. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it, it's, you know, there are certain things that just catch on based on the tools that we have now. Um, and obviously anybody who is trying to get as much attention, particularly not known artist um, beforehand, will try to figure out, okay, how do I get the most attention the way that you would get the most attention by having, a, you know, a a grabbing headline on YouTube or, you know, all of those things, like all of the ways that social media management actually already works. But the fact that it works for popular music now and, you know, and is kind of turning into this new thing is pretty fascinating. I wonder if some people hearing this are thinking, Oh, uh, where is the art? Where is the artist's freedom to well, the, express Well, the, the art's already there. The no, artists are doing their I, thing, right? I, well, I think, first of all, yes, I, I disagree with those people who say this. And <laughs> and it's also, yeah, there, there were always, uh, let's say, there have always been a certain segment of the music industry and artists even that cater their... Uh, art to 
being as uh, catchy and popular as possible. And there will always be, even now, people who don't really care about that and who make the music that they uh, they want to make. Um, I think among those artists we mentioned, I don't think we, we look at them, and maybe that's something that's a little bit different. I don't think we would view them as like products made by manufacturers like producers that want a hit song they seem like genuine artists and and so i don't know that that uh, uh worry would really hold up to scrutiny well it's an interesting thought right because in the days when you had to convince a representative at a label uh to push you to make you successful the perception was they're not successful because they're good they're successful because the label spent a bunch of money on them and that's not legitimate and so i'm an artist who's who's you know true to the music but this situation is different this is popular appeal in a in a more direct way this is saying mm. it's not a label deciding whether i'm successful it's all of the users of tiktok and instagram and twitter and so there's a there's a different criticism that can be had about that about you know lowest common denominator and you know massive popularity versus you know doing it for the art still i mean that's still there but it's it's less about well you're not a legitimate artist because you just got picked by the money people it there, there's a popular appeal here and a lot of artists i think they make their song and then figure out how to promote it while artists like lil nas x are like no man i designed this song from the beginning to be <laughs> memeable like i wanted to lean into that right. i don't think there's anything wrong with that well and you know in the last few years i remember there was you know, a video that went uh, around the internets about the fact that, like, look at this Nickelback song versus this other Nickelback song. It's the same song. That you know, the 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 guts of the song are exactly the same. They just changed the lyrics because the song was already popular once. This is exactly what's going on here. Like, you figure hmm. out what is a you know, like what is going to be a hit, and a hit now meaning what is going to be socially popular, and you're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah. And the gatekeepers are not as powerful as they used to be and are more distributed. So it's, it, it changes the landscape. Uh, hey, thanks, guys, everybody. I yes. Think, sorry, just to finish up on this, I think we have to figure out how to make podcasts memeable. That's <laughs> well, where we have to go. Have we, have we not? Darn it. All right. <laughs> more memeable. One more, more. thing to do. <laughs> hey, thanks, everybody who participates in our subreddit. In fact... If you want to make our podcast more memeable, that would be a great place to do it. You can submit <laughs> stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Vote for the stuff you like. Uh, submit the stuff that you want and help us make your show tomorrow. Ooh, do we have any memes in the mailbag? Oh, uh, you know, it's funny that you asked, Tom. We do. Gary Fisher. Hello, Gary. Friend of the show. Has a weekly podcast called Diary of a Senior Geek that he submitted to us because we've been asking for folks who are doing their own stuff like, hey, let us know what you're doing so that we can share with the greater good. He says it's less than 20 minutes long. Recently been an eclectic mix mix of stories from my life, stories from my dad's life, and also personal takes on life. Gary draws from a long life in IT along with a wealth of other experience. So you probably have a little bit in common with Gary. And thanks, Gary, for letting us know that you're doing your thing. Yeah. Go, go check out Diary of a Senior Geek, anchor.fm slash Gary dash Fisher. And we'll have that link in our show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com as well. Also want to take a shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Erwin Stir, Justin Zellers, and Tim Deputy. Also, thanks to Patrick Beja for being with us today. It's late where you are. It's not that late where we are. Patrick, where can people keep up with everything you do in between? Great, great uh, handoff. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know what? Um, if you speak French or if you want to speak French or if you want to practice French, just go check out Le Rendez-vous Tech. You enjoy tech, so you probably know about half the words we use. So it would be an easy way to do all of that. Le Rendez-vous Tech is at frenchspin.fr and on your podcast app, of course. And a uh, big uh, appreciation to everybody who's able to continue to support the show. Uh, and uh, More and more, there are people who are struggling right now and can't. And it's really nice to be able to tell them uh, when they're like, hey, I'm going to have to stop supporting for a while. 
don't worry, you're covered uh, because we've had so many other people step up and cover us uh, and get some nice perks uh, when they do at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you've got feedback, that's the place to send it. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more and tell a friend at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>